Hello, my name is Martha Gutierrez Stalker. I speak English and I speak Spanish. That's why I have a Spanish name and an English name. And today I'd like to share with you a story about a little boy. A story I wrote some years ago because this boy is very important to all of us and we're going to call him the Little Raptor. This is the universal story of children who find freedom. It is said that there's an island, the most beautiful island that human eyes have ever seen, where a young boy played. The royal palms sway at the beach of the tropical island in the breeze. The bright sun shines on the green meadows and the blue ocean waves which surround this paradise resemble sapphires. Sapphires are precious stones, blue precious stones, and this was the way it looked at that time. With snow peaks as the water never, never touches the ocean on the shore. For centuries, many desired her, and some possessed her. Spain, France, Great Britain, and a son. Her freedom-loving children broke the chains of foreign domination and governed her for 57 years in peace and harmony. The arts, music, and literature flourished. The name of Cuba became known in all corners of the world through the works of Martí, a famous writer and patriot, Laguna, an incredible musician, Belize, a woman who painted her soul, and her many other children were recognized worldwide for their talent. Children who brought honor and glory to the motherland. In this peaceful environment, children played in the parks, under the silk cotton and the royal poinciana trees. We've all seen the royal poinciana trees here at home, because they have beautiful red flowers all during the spring. And this is where the children play. Suddenly, in the dark of the night, when a new year was about to begin, one of her own sons, a son without a heart, robbed this island paradise. New Year was a very important day for Cubans. Because families got together, they had dinner together, they sang, they danced. It was just a very, very important and happy day for all the Cubans. The Pearl of the Antilles, as it was called, was taken and buried her in darkness. And so the nightmare began. The nightmare, you know, when you're sleeping and you have these terrible dreams and it's just a nightmare. Well, this is what happened here. It was a nightmare. The nightmare which exiled thousands, separated many, and took the lives of fathers and mothers who left their children orphaned. To be in exile means to leave your home and go somewhere else that is not well known to you, knowing that you can never return home. Heartaches and despair shrink everyone's heart. But few dare rise the cry of protest against the tyrant. Protest. How do you protest against something that is not something you feel is right? It's dangerous to protest. And so it was dangerous here because they know they risk their lives. They know they risk their children's lives, their grandparents, the entire family. What is there to do as the father? What is there to do as the mother? The child draws with an old pencil in a wrinkled piece of paper he found in a garbage can and listened to his parents. The father was already thinking about the details. A friend has told him that near some beaches people are building some rafts. You know what a raft is, it's something that you go in the ocean and you float or you go in a river and you float. These rafts that they were finding were made of found materials. If they can pick them up without being spotted by the police, 
all wood, ropes, pieces of rubber, rusty materials. The friend says that this is a risky journey, that it is possible to die during the crossing, but that there are many who make it to the country of hope and generosity, the United States. One day, the father makes an announcement. We must leave our home, travel across the ocean, and seek refuge in the arms of a free country, only 90 miles away from Cuba. To seek refuge, when you seek refuge means you go somewhere where you know you will be safe from any danger that you're afraid of. The mother does not understand what has happened, and worried, she asks, how will we travel? Will we need a boat? And we hardly have enough money for food. What will happen to our son? He is so small to take such a journey. The small raft can barely hold three or four people. However, 12 people went wait by the shore to begin their flight to freedom because they're desperate to get away. They're afraid to stay home. The boy holding on tightly to the mother's hand carries, hidden in the pocket of his torn trousers, the old pencil and the wrinkled piece of paper. Everything seems now ready. The time to leave has arrived. The few provisions, water, bread, some canned milk have been carefully placed on the floor of the raft. They cannot carry many things because the raft is so small and there's so many more people than usually should be in this little raft. Women and children are the first to take place inside the small raft. Suddenly, voices are heard. Halt! Halt in the name of the law! The men who were getting ready to board the raft begin to run, trying to escape from the soldiers who have begun to fire their guns at them. Some are wounded. Others manage to escape. The father of the little rafter lies motionless on the beach. The mothers have escaped with their children because remember they were the first ones to get into the raft. The waves keep pushing the raft towards the open ocean. In the distance, the beautiful land remains. In the distance, the brothers, the grandparents remain, and a father who gave his life to save his son. Many days have passed, although the notion of time has been lost and it seems more like years have gone by. You know, when you're somewhere that you're not sure where you are and you don't really know what's going to be coming next, time seems to change, time seems different. You don't know if a day has gone by or years have gone by. The intense heat from the sun, the lack of food and water begins to cloud the eyes and the mind. The mothers, in their desire to save their children, have stopped drinking the little water they have, and one at a time, they have fallen asleep forever. When you get very thirsty and you don't have much to drink, you will start getting very sleepy, and then maybe you get sick because you need water to survive, and the mothers were wanting their children to survive, so they would not drink and let the children take that water. Each night, the little rafter cuddles next to his mother, waiting for the dawn of a new day, a new day that will bring freedom. They fear the sharks that constantly surround the raft. This night, the little rafter sleeps next to his mother, but this night would be different. At dawn, the little rafter feels the mother's cold hand. The mother lies motionless in the raft. The little rafter caresses the mother's forehead. Perhaps he can wake her up. 
Perhaps his tears can give her the water she needs to open up her eyes. You know, sometimes when you're really, really asleep and you don't want to wake up, but somebody touches your forehead, you open your eyes and then you're awake. So this is what the little raptor thought was going to happen to his mother. The little raptor hugs the lifeless mother. Finally, sleeps take over. Suddenly, the sound of many voices and the noise of motors, motors running, wake him. In front of his eyes, there is a big gray ship and soldiers. He's scared. The little raptor wonders if these are the same soldiers who made him an orphan. Remember, when they were getting ready to get on the raft, the soldiers were shooting at them, and that's where his father lost his life. So he's afraid of these soldiers. Again, he doesn't know who they are. The ship gets closer, and the, wa <clears throat> the waves he bears do not speak in voices in Spanish. And he has learned some English in school, but he's a little bit confused. The little raptor recognizes the soldiers are North American, from the United States. The father and the mother always told him these were good soldiers. These soldiers would help them. The little rafter grabs the hand that helps him out of the raft and takes him to the gray ship. For the last time, he looks at the mother. For the last time, he kisses her. The ship is big and painted gray and every member of the crew is smiling. They hug him. They gave him to drink and to eat. They gave him new clothes. The little raptor remember his old pencil and the wrinkled paper on which he has been drawing. Hurriedly, he looks into the pocket of his old pants, and once again, he hides the old pencil and the wrinkled paper in the pockets of the new trousers. The little raptor, sad and tired, goes to sleep on the fresh bed and sleeps soundly. They wake him up and tell him they have arrived. Finally, the little raptor thinks, I will be free. He runs out on deck and his big eyes see at a short distance a barbed wire fence and the flag of the United States. What has happened? The little raptor does not understand. Has he arrived at a jail? He sees all this barbed wire. Is it that orphans cannot be free? A man dressed in a white uniform approaches and smiles. Do not be afraid. You are in the United States territory, but you are still in Cuba. You have arrived at the Guantanamo Naval Base. You see, the United States has many naval bases all around the world. And Guantanamo Base is one of those, and it is in Cuba. So the little raptor was actually still in Cuba. Very soon, the president will grant permission for you to travel to the United States and be reunited with your relatives. The man in the white uniform promised he would soon travel to the United States. Soon, but months have gone by. The little raptor spends his days thinking of the mother, thinking of the father. He spends the nights drawing with his old pencil on his wrinkled paper. Others, many of whom are parents who have lost their children, take care of the little raptor and try to cheer him up. The little raptor smiles, sadly, for he knows this is not freedom. It is Christmas Eve. The little raptor combs his hair and gets ready to join the youth choir that has been invited to sing in the chapel of the naval base. They have been practicing for many, many weeks. The choir director, a young balsero raptor himself, has taught the younger ones to pray by singing praises to God. The little raptor sings with more devotion than ever before. Tomorrow it will be Christmas. Tomorrow it will just be another day. The man in the white uniform smiles and approaches the little rafter. But 
This time he is not walking, he is running towards him. This time, to make the trip you have dreamed about has come. He says as he embraces him. Let's go. The ship that will take you to the United States will be leaving shortly. The young choir director comes over and says, You see how God listens to us even when we sing. So finally, the time to come to the United States is here. It is a sunny day and the ocean is still. On the deck of the ship, the little rafter looks up at the sky, perhaps trying to see the mother and trying to see the father. As he looks up, his eyes see many white stars, red and white stripes, and the blue sky. No, these are not stars and stripes in the blue sky. He wonders and then realizes this is the flag of the United States of America, proudly blowing in the wind on the highest part of the ship for the mother and the father to see from heaven. It is protecting the little rafter. He knows that his mother and father are still looking after him, all the way from heaven. Suddenly, at a distance, he sees the shore of the new homeland, where he will finally have arrived soon. A new homeland, where he finds a most precious gift called freedom. I hope you will join us again so that we can follow the little rafter and all the adventures that are waiting him in his new land with his new relatives. And we will follow him and see how he grows and how he will be someone who's very proud of his mother and his father. We'll see you soon.